Um, my computer. We're all ready. We're running. Well, welcome everyone. Bienvenidos to Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I'm Sandy Anone, your host, and I'm so grateful to be joining you on this super Sunday. However, for us here at Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, every Sunday is super Sunday because we gather here at Cultivating Voices Live Poetry for a weekly reading where we share the love of poetry in community. We know that the world continues to be fraught with conflict and the myriad ways that COVID has continued to alter our lives, but we've continued to use this platform, this weekly platform with all of you to explore really the prismatic aspects of humanity. Last year at this time, we were celebrating our Laureate Love Fest. Uh, we had an international poets laureate uh, gathering and it was a spectacular display of poetry. Well, we wanted to um, we, we wanted to do something different this year and we still were having our new books showcase. Um, and I'm so, so, so just ecstatic that we were able this year to have our uh, Valentine's Day kind of reading coincide with um, these three poets that you'll be hearing from today. Uh, and I'll be sharing a little bit more about them as each of them reads. Thanks to everyone who joined us last week to read and listen in our Zoom poetry studio and on Facebook. And of course, welcome to those of you here with us today. We had a very moving wild card open mic last week. And I, I'd like to remind you that you can watch all of our readings by searching our Facebook page and our YouTube channel to uh, revisit or view for the first time. And if you'd like to revisit that Laureate Love Fest that was co-sponsored with the Olympia Poetry Network, I think it would be a fine thing for you to do on Valentine's Day. Well, this week, on our pre-Valentine's Day reading, we return, as I mentioned, to our new books showcase platform, uh, welcoming and celebrating three spectacular poets with new collections, Susan Abbott, Annie Christine, and Mary Miriam. I'll introduce, as I mentioned, each of them before they read. Well, it is always, it is always a great Sunday when we're able to listen to the poetry of Susan Abbott, whose work many of us have come to know and right, appreciate right here during our open mics. So it's tremendously gratifying to be able today to feature her with her first solo poetry collection and celebrate that accomplishment. Susan Abbott is an artist poet who lives in Joshua Tree, California. In her varied working life, she has done many things ranging from meat wrapper to technical editor to hospice chaplain, all of which have informed her work as an artist and author. Her work has most recently appeared in the Hala Needles Literary Monthly, Judy Grand's Touching Creatures, Touching Spirit, Living in a Sentient World, Feckless Cunt, a feminist anthology edited by Susan Rukeyser, and Between Ourselves, Letters Between Mothers and Daughters from Karen Payne, editor. 
Susan's art is featured along with Cynthia Anderson's poetry in their collaborative chapbook, Now Voyager from 2018. She is the author of the poetic manifesto, Nasty Women Rise, The Dream and the Curse from 2017. And today we welcome her and celebrate, as I mentioned, her first solo art and poetry collection, The Everyday Holy of We. Would you please welcome Susan Abbott? Hello, everybody, and thank you, Sandy, for that wonderful introduction. Um, this, this forum of Cultivating Voices has been just such a boon this past year. I, it was about a year ago that I think I discovered you, and it was a little under a year ago that I started writing villanelles, and it's almost become like a second language to me. If I hear a phrase I like or an idea that's interesting to me, I'm asking myself, how would you say that in villanelle? So um, my book here, The Everyday Holy of We, is largely villanelles. Um, and I've been having fun with them, kind of like a cross between crossword puzzles and Sudoku uh, to fill in the blanks and come up with rhymes and repeating lines. Anyhow, this book <clears throat> is uh, art and poetry, both by me. This cover image is called the... Um, Sister Serpent Dreaming. And a lot of these poems are kind of very dreamy. The imagery that goes with them is very in from you know dreamscapes. And um, it's an homage to women, an homage to women that are mythical, biblical, familial, imaginal, all that. So, um, and it's in two sections. The first section is called uh, Summons of a Common Sisterhood. And it opens with a quote an epigraph from Muriel Kaiser, <clears throat> and it says, a long history forever, some woman dancing, making shapes in the air. And there are many images of women dancing, making shapes in the air in this, uh, in this work. So I will share them with you as I read the poems. The first poem I'm gonna read is called, um, <clears throat> just summons, and it was a summons of the common sisterhood. And um, this is the image that goes with that. And um, the image is called, it blew Sparky's mind to remember how to speak fire. Sparky is a character in a lot of these drawings and she emerged in the process of writing this book as well. Summons, <clears throat> she speaks to you in a language of fire, claims your whole life as a sign your heart bends to her every desire. It's not like you're a message for hire or ripe fruit to be plucked from the vine. She speaks to you in a language of fire. The things you know that come to inspire are neither the water or the wine. Your heart bends to her every desire. The breath of her love in you does conspire together for energy and matter to shine. She speaks to you in a language of fire. Embody truth, answer all who inquire. In their emptiness, know them as divine. Your heart bends to her every desire. The call on your life may, you may think is dire, a thing of no reason or rhyme. She speaks to you in a language of fire. Your heart bends to her every desire. Thank you. And then <clears throat> this second poem, thank you, is involves fire a bit too. This image is a painting called Miriam on the Mesa. And um, the poem is called Miriam's Daughter. And I believe it's the first one I ever read to Cultivating Voices. And it was kind of my introduction to you guys and your introduction to me. Miriam's Daughter. Across the desert, a monsoon spills its water, torrents of rain and the washes flood. This is the prophet Miriam's daughter. Witness to killings, the genocidal slaughter, the stolen lands, the indigenous blood. Across the desert, a monsoon spills its water. Plant medicine mother nature has taught her to repair the world for the common good. This is the prophet Miriam's daughter. 
To those who make jokes or would mock her, she is drink to the thirsty, a spark to the wood. Across the desert, a monsoon spills its water. Out of this storm, the new seeds it brought her, a generous crop, the sustaining food. This is the prophet, Miriam's daughter. Clouds will pass over like locusts and plagues. Let the earth mix with water and give us our mud. Across the desert, a monsoon spills its water. This is the prophet, Miriam's daughter. Thank you. And then um, this next one I'm gonna read is called Amazon. This is the image that goes with it. And it's called the mask of loyalty. <clears throat> Amazon, in a dark cave within the wood, a shelter of rock and earth. To us, it was the core of all good. For when the chill came, we understood to build us here a hearth in a dark cave within the wood. We cut our palms and rubbed our blood to mark our true bonds worth. And to us, it was the core of all good. Then came the moons of our sisterhood, rites of pleasure and of birth in a dark cave within the wood. We sang the songs, we cooked the food over musty fires of turf. And to us, it was the core of all good. Bare-breasted we rode, an Amazon brood embodied the heart of the earth in a dark cave within the wood. To us, it was the core of all good. And then one more from this section, it's, it's called Escape. This is the image that goes with it. And this again is Sparky. It blew Sparky's mind how perplexing life could be. And this is a, an, an homage to my mother, Escape. <clears throat> she packed up her babies and ran, determined to never look back, took a train far away from that man. The marriage wasn't according to plan. He wasn't so great in the sack. She packed up her babies and ran. Mean and abusive, he got out of hand. The broads and booze behind her back took a train far away from that man. Under the gun, you do what you can. Shift gears to divorce on fast track. She packed up her babies and ran. Leave all that knitting. Don't wash that pan. Don't worry about what you may lack. Take a train far away from that man. To hell with the homestead's free land, the dream of Alaska's outback. She packed up her babies and ran, took us away from that man. And then um, one more from this section, it's called Crone. This is the image that goes with it. And in this image, it's titled, When Sparky's Mind Blew, Her Body Became a Rainbow. Crone. Her sleep is erratic, her days alone, the nights neither virgin nor whore, but the visions and dreams of a crone. The coming of floods to polish the stone, leveling back to what was before, her sleep erratic, her days alone. The coming of fire burns back to bone, so predators haunt her no more. Such are the visions and dreams of a crone. The wind sweeps in with its whistling moan, takes the planet's dust out of its core. Her sleep is erratic, her days alone. I see eons over which no dove has flown, the madness of what lies in store, grave are the visions and dreams of a crone. Earth my li may lie fallow where nothing has grown, the raven cawed its last nevermore. Her sleep is erratic, her days alone. Pregnant, the visions and dreams of a crone. Thank you. And then this next section is called The Abiding Spark. And it's uh, this is homage to my partner, Dee Dee. We were together for 43 years and she passed away about three years ago from um, multiple systems atrophy. And um, this first poem I'm gonna read is called Blood Memory. And the image that goes with it is Sparky's mind blue while giving birth. For that I have known you from the start, you, dear one of original blessing, our mother's blood speaks through this heart. Through eons of wandering, we can barely chart to these desert days of struggle and stressing, for that I have known you from the start. The ground of being, that solid part, 
that never had us guessing. Our mother's blood speaks to this heart. In all our relations, the abiding spark, the cloak of time compressing, for that I have known you from the start. Forgetting slips to seed in the dark, while in the womb caressing, our mother's blood speaks through this heart. Remember, love, we did not part, the separation only window dressing, for that we have known this from the start, our mother's blood speaks through this heart. And then um, I have this other one. This one is called Nautilus Girl. And there's my Nautilus Girl paintings. Um, Nautilus Girl, when into the core of you I want to curl and through each chamber come to know how love is a spiral, my Nautilus Girl. How your shape lifts us up in its muscular swirl, twists of tornadoes, the symmetry of snow, when into the core of you I begin to curl. Magnetic impulse from a grain to the pearl, listen to the waves, let the trade winds blow. How love is a spiral, my Nautilus girl. Love be numinous and make right the world. Each sacred room we come to outgrow, still into the core of you I want to curl. Together to swim through a tempestuous world, all joys and trials that life will bestow, how love makes us spiral, my Nautilus girl. An ocean of need, the tides will unfurl, the moonlight sees the waters below, when into the core of you I want to curl, we make love our spiral, my Nautilus girl. And then, this next one is called Such a Pair, and this is an image, and um, it's called A Blue Sparky's Mind to Kiss Her Best Girl Under the Northern Lights. So there she's kissing her best girl. <clears throat> Such a pair. You lift your wings and take to the air. Your ruffled white crown heads for clear sky. I raise up my shoulders and follow you there. Smell the spruce buds, the scatter of a bear the breath of a whale not asking why, you lift your wings and take to the air. The nest we did leave without a care, all twigs and moss, untethered we fly. I raise up my shoulders and follow you there. Higher and higher as if on a dare, give chase in the wind to the eternal cry. You lift your wings and take to the air. Clasping our talons, love spins and lays bare, free and falling, these last things are wise. I raise up my shoulders and follow you there. At last to let go in that moment, most aware of love and death in a deep forest dawn. You lift your wings and take to the air. I raise up my shoulders and follow you there. And um, <clears throat> thank you. This next one is called Inquiry. In this image, this is of, of me and Dee Dee. And um, in the images, the painting is called Lesbian Coping Mechanisms, Walking My Girl Home. Inquiry. Down to the bare bones, that specter of you, trying on death till it felt, felt like a glove, asking, where should I be? What should I do? I sit at the table, sip the morning's brew, no escape from the sword looming above down to bare bones, that specter of you. Your appetite gone, gait shuffling your shoe. Flowers fade in your hair plucked from the grove, asking, where should I be? What should I do? Nerves all unraveling, gone is their glue. The brain eating crow, your heart is a dove. Down to bare bones, that specter of you. Sleep, the only comfort and dreams that ensue as death our lives makes ready to move on, asking, where should I be? What should I do? And now that you've left with that ancestral crew, I keep to a path of this ancient love, down to bare bones, that specter of you, asking, where should I be? What should I do? And that's us. Thank you. And then, um, just one more. I'm going to close with the title poem, The Everyday Holy of We, and it is my Valentine to you um, and to all of us with love. And this um, image is just called Love Concentrates. So love concentrates on us today. 
the everyday holy of we. I carried your ashes, traveled far and wide to places, places we both wanted to see. It meant everything with you by my side. To feel you with me along for the ride, to go full circle and come around free. I carried your ashes, traveled far and wide. Often we laughed, often we cried. You went on ahead without me. It meant everything with you by my side. When comes the memory of the morning you died, the sum of your suffering went peacefully. I carried your ashes, traveled far and wide. The bath and anointing you so dignified, festive in flowers, clothed in the galaxy. Life was everything with you by my side. You blessed the world, how love clarified the everyday holy of we. I carried your ashes, traveled far and wide. It meant everything with you by my side. And I thank you for listening. This is the book, The Everyday Holy of We. Go buy it. You'll get art and poetry. Thanks. <clears throat> oh, Susan. Oh, the everyday holy of we. Uh, I, 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 a, a, a great opening to what I'm what I'm affectionately calling our lesbian love fest today. And thank you for those not only the poems, but the images too. They're so vibrant and they really, for me also brought out the vibrancy and the poignancy um, within, um, you know, within your poems. And I'm so, so glad that we traditionally think of the sonnet as the love poem but uh, you've really cl claimed the villanelle as, uh, as a love poem. I've heard it time and time again, and I'm always, always moved by, um, by your tributes to, by your tributes and poetry to Dee Dee. And I'm really, really glad that we were able to have this platform today for you to share them once again, um, you know, to share, to share that, that really amazing relationship um, through the amazing relationship of poetry. So thank you. Thank, thank you so you. very, very much. Um, there's no villains in the villanelle with Susan. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just the love fest. It's just the love. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, we move from, from one very moving poet um, to our next poet. And I'm just, again, I, I'm really quite, quite uh, excited to be able to support poets that um, win particular prizes uh, and, and help promote their work. And none, and, and, and I can't be any happier than to be able to support the work from um, a press that for me is, we talk with uh, Michael Anthony Ingram about quintessential listening. Well, for me, the poetry of Headmistress Press is quintessential poetry. And we get today to celebrate with Annie Christine um, her award-winning book. And not only do we have the pleasure of, the, of being able to do that, but we also are able to do that with her editor joining us as well as reading. So it's a quite special, um, a special twist on, 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 on the love today uh, to, have, uh, to have the editor and the writer uh, together in the room sharing work together. It's, it's really terrific. Well, let me tell you a little bit more about the work and personhood of Annie Christine. 
Annie Christine is a professor of composition and English speakers of other languages at the State University of New York in Cobbleskill and a former artist resident of the Shanghai Swatch Art Peace Hotel and the Arctic Circle Art and Science Expedition. If that doesn't whet your appetite, I don't know what will. Her poems have appeared in the Seneca Review, Oxford Poetry, Prelude, and The Lifted Brow, among many others. She was a first place winner of the Driftwood Prize in-house poem contest and received the grand prize of the Hart Crane Memorial Poetry Contest, the Greg Grummer Poetry Award, the Oakland School of the Arts, Anisigam Poetry Award, and the Neil Shepard Prize in Poetry. Her books include Tall As You Are Tall Between Them, from CNR Press in 2016, and her latest, the one we celebrate today in the new book showcase, is The Vanguards of Holography from Headmistress Press 2021, which was the winner of the Sappho Prize in Poetry. Please welcome Annie Christine. Thank you very much, and I am so excited to be here. And the first poem that I'm going to read um, was one that I actually wrote at the Swatch Art Peace Hotel uh, when I was a resident there for three months in Shanghai. And all of these poems are from my new book, The Vanguards of Holography, published through Headmistress Press. We never really touch anyone because of molecules. Kubrick himself was reported as being tearful wandering around the set of the huge centrifuge after filming on 2001 was complete. AV forums. Anyone can wear molecules of what they say they represent, but I need yours. The boom box I place over my head outside your window records proof of your existence, though colliding isn't actually touching. I described the rings of Jupiter into the tape recorder before NASA reported on them, a symbol as a surgical tool? And if we are all mathematical gear wheel cutouts, the first programmable device, that means you are too. All I know is that a fallen one who is not in your body is in hell. My brain fills in the rest. In the documentary, I made a Valentine's Day card that said, I love mama because she keeps a gun at her bedside table. But the filmmaker said that wasn't a good reason. I told him he never had to realize while naked and bleeding how even the color of his front door could set someone off in this world. I just wanted to trick him into saying he was there too. One family kept all concepts of time and dates away from their daughter. Another child broke her bones for attention. My church has a sanctuary just for this I built for you. These days, the equivalent of 13 people taking off their clothes, trying to make the calendar work with one or two blank days I'm trapped in, is heavy on my mind. I saw Jupiter's rings, but in the folds from one moment to another, it's not a face, it's a city. It's not space, it's a black rectangle inserted in the frame. In Revelation, John wrote locusts, Vietnam vets say Cobra helicopters, or John just had a vision of a helicopter movie and the movie was only made so John would see it. A widescreen cinema screen and the monolith from 2001 share the same dimensions. People my age know all about special children with electrodes on our heads, moving military milk cap coinage with our minds, being asked how we feel. I still haven't gotten paid. I only left my body to access the doctored photo of Jupiter's rings. No actual ones exist. Some human looking face in a stone wall or in the chalk toss pregame ritual isn't what you are. It's just what helps me to survive. Great. A 
Okay, this is an apoc apocalyptic poem. And the concept behind this was in my first book, I uh, wrote a poem uh, that had the word stupidly in it. And when I read the book again, like five years later, I kind of wished I could go back and edit that and take it out. <laughs> and then I decided, no, I'll write a poem where I put stupidly in each stanza and then I'll own it. So the sun's so hot, I froze to death, Susanna, don't you cry, annihilation event. Susanna, my eyes are closed, but the black curtain parts and I see nothing like has been out there before. My third eye jeers me, but is all about me. I run stupidly, not being able to plan ahead. In fact, this could be my actual past. A confused man rubs dandelions on his face. The yellow smear upends his subtle body as he runs stupidly into an army ranger in sniper mode aiming at the second sun. The ranger quickly readjusts to shoot the man dead, Susanna. Just yesterday, I came across a royalty-free stock photo of a businessman putting a flower in a rifle barrel and thought, what? I download an app for the visually impaired so a volunteer from a network can use my camera and explain my scene. The woman's eyes run stupidly inside themselves, a treadmill powering itself on looking for a heart rate. People in the 4th of July parade are setting off fireworks without permission, she says. But I see it's a perfect sphere exiting the first sun, Susanna, raining down gas in a purposeful way towards anything living. People rush to loot the supermarket just in case. A man already out the door with a cart full of ham hocks, pork loins, turkey wings, and coffee turns around, runs stupidly to the toy aisle, and then to the cashier to give her some emoji tattoos. He says, a temporary tattoo will replace debit cards in the future, as if this is an alternate way of paying. She sets them on top of the cash register with the others and ties a shoelace around her upper arm for the hit. She doesn't have any heroin, Susanna. Ice bodies in a sky belt run stupidly there and melt, not so much for me, but maybe. I'm not out of excuses. Someone could share my same center of mass now without pretensions, but I'm misting out chemicals to hide myself so I won't have to kill anyone. It feels right, everything feels as right as it should be, and I'm hearing the earth's hum, even though it's supposed to be beyond my threshold. And all I know, Susanna, is the hum never originated in the earth at all. All right, the next poem is called The Vanguards of Philography, which is uh, the name of the book as well. And it's full of holograms. <laughs> He realized at once that he shouldn't have spoken aloud and that by doing so he had, in, in a sense, acknowledged the stranger's right to oversee his actions, the trial, Kafka. We know that when your kids hear adults scream, they don't yet have a need to apologize just to make it stop. But we need this excitement. As gregarious scientists of humans, only one of us can play out in your brain long enough to build a map of your home. In the meantime, I need to hear you cry more than once in public. I use ultrasound to disrupt the air around your hologram and insert a tumor inside of it. You are going to become infected without us anyway. I could just see us holding a skull, asking the youth to reach inside while you get sick. It's not possible for us to gain anything by pretending to like you, so we work on you while we are very upset with you. Each dissected piece of the mouse brain contains the whole, so nothing we've done to you is irreversible. If it weren't for the glitch, I would be sitting in court right now with lots of work to do in 2001 with Al Gore as president. Though I destroyed the Buddhist ruins, the 3D light projection replacement was going to create many jobs, but no one else saw it that way. I won't go back. I am here first with the devil clip art. I will make Tupac my student. So many people are writing down their intentions, sprinkling the paper with blood, and uploading it to the internet. I know all about it. Space is water, compasses are spears of destiny, so that's why they were removed as Monopoly game pieces. Every compass points to me. Be content with the iron, as we tell you all the things about yourself you don't know. We are the vanguards of holography, and I'm blocking your way from the memory of the earth. Thank you. All right, so I lived in China for three years um, teaching English, English there. 
And I never saw the terracotta warriors, but I always wanted to. So I, I did some research on them and found a lot of interesting stuff out about them. So this is sort of like an alternative history take on how they were constructed and is in the voice of the emperor at the time who um, ordered that they be built or constructed. We'll always have terracotta warriors dusted in Han purple, never looking behind. Drinking mercury to the mystery of all that you should ever leave behind in time, Ava adore Billy Corgan. My purple skin projects royal essences onto the soon to die in the name of defense. When they die, they never had it so good. Mercury rolls and spreads over my central nervous system, shifting me partway up. The more I'm admired, the more my men are pushed down, ready to leave their clay selves and organs for future inspection. Each man makes me feel like crone and king, capable of passing as physical. My subterranean tunnels are a puzzle box with walls that open and close only if the warriors walk through them on the way to the lower world. But mother told me to pretend to be afraid of ghosts, and then the commoners would think that's why I do everything I do. I etched a citizen's name on each warrior's foot so those named would die with the warriors in a sympathetic way. Dipping curled paper into machine spun mercury, I surround myself with those bouquets and their electromagnetic fields. I said I would live forever, but I didn't say where. Hosed with Han purple after a temperature drop, staring straight ahead with an anything goes attitude, the warriors protrude their stained abdomens, ready to see if color affects the sexual attraction of the beings pulling them down from the lower side. The higher the beings arousal, the more likely the warriors will go critical and lose a dimension. The principles behind it is how Shanghai will develop the first commercial magnetic levitation train. What remains of the warriors is what my outside body was from the start, very ill, but human looking from 10 feet away or more. The Han purple stacks the air unevenly and my core self walks away on that grand staircase. My favorite concubine may think she left me, but 2000 years on earth is 10 minutes to me in the upper dimension. So here it's like it never happened. We'll always have China, we'll always have terracotta warriors dusted in Han purple, never looking behind but I'll always be heaven, a big head on a great person as the oracle bone scripts make me out to be, gone for my own reasons. Great. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay, okay. Uh, this next one, uh, one summer I was doing some research on psionics, which is sort of the supernatural paranormal field of study where people believe that they can move things with their minds, like people with their minds, or uh, put energy into different kinds of geometrical patterns and influence people with their thoughts and actions. Uh, so <laughs> this poem deals with that. Paper machines. Keanu Reeves and I actually got married in Dracula, she told Entertainment Weekly. No, I swear to God, I think we're married in real life. Why not a writer? There are things I can pour into you to make a campaign with a part of my foot touching home plate somewhere to exude a greatness. Mom says someday I won't need to imagine four angels with their open mouths aiming light toward me just to get out of bed in the morning. But the guidebook says I've already lost if I think in terms of a future. I swear to God, I think we're married in real life. Once you have a mind domicile, you can put anyone in there. The de decoder ring fits twisted into cardboard, turned towards Saturn. The taste of blood I imagine to invoke a demon. I don't feel bad about it. The pentacle on a round transparency taped to a flashlight aimed at your passport photo. Even the drawing of the circuitry of a death ray gun can work if I touch it. At three hours before an event, things are totally unchangeable. So I have until then. You have no idea how things happen here anymore. I had a dream you gave birth to a boy. I cupped his head close and said, relieved, it's him. I need better ways to thatch our minds together, but I can spin around and around if I start to lose it. The original Hebrew was smudged on accident, how it stays in all future spellings, because we can't bear to lose all the fury poured into a damaged talisman. That's all a language is. Planets that give in to everyone's same opinion of how best to inflict pain. 
Our past should go either way now if you let it. I'm never supposed to lift the pen until I write all it is I want. Um, so I'll read uh, one more here. Thank you so much. Let's see. All right. So this um, in my in my uh, book, I had a challenge to myself to try to write about things that have been overdone. So I write about the Matrix. I wrote about the Matrix, <laughs> and the next is the Bible. So it's like, what what new thing can you say or write? Uh, so this is about uh, Joseph's uh, coat, the colored coat. All right, multicolored coat. But it's uh, reimagining using, so it's like the idea of using it, uh, current technology and inserting it to the past. Drunk historicity, Joseph's teleportation staff found in a recent archaeological dig with all messages to the Pharaoh stored and intact. Now, I know we had no money, but I was as rich as I could be in my coat of many colors my mama made for me, Dolly Parton. Everyone wanted to know why Rachel just gave birth to a lizard, and Jacob explained to all of his sons that this is baby Joseph, and he's a chief administrator, and when he's old enough, he'll wear a coat of many colors his mom will make for him. Nanobots in clay surrounded by silicon for the bots to link to and transmit a human body. His sons were like, fuck that, but okay. As soon as Joseph started talking, his brother, he told his brothers they would all bow to him and his, autotono his autonomic nervous system would be powered by their children's fear. When Joseph got his coat, so many people started offering him no interest loans and asking him to rule them. His father loved it. His brothers noticed if they stressed Joseph out, like by calling him a reptile or shouting out the names of the coiled spirits they could see spinning in the back of his head, his face would glitch as if it was a steel pin impression toy that someone punched. Joseph's coat was running on some new Coke formula shit level math, but he was beautiful most of the time, like a Canaanite Donny Osmond. Soon, his brothers tossed out Joseph, stole his holographic coat, and put goat's blood on it to show their father. About 10 minutes after the father saw the coat and screamed, why, why, not my miracle son, the coat contracted into a mesh ball drone that flew back to Joseph, unfurled, and then wagon forded him back into a human. Plus, the coat made him get sick high from the blood, which was its second main function. Fast forward about 20 years, and Joseph was now right-hand man to the pharaoh because Joseph had wings, which meant he came from the royal line of Alpha Draconis, just like the pharaoh. Joseph saw his brothers one day shopping for wheat, so Joseph gave them riches and all the wheat they could carry. But the wheat had a GMO signature that meant all future crops grown from that seed would belong to the pharaoh. Plus, the pharaoh met the family and basically said, yeah, take care of my livestock. All along, the father wanted to be reptilian, so he asked Joseph to inject him with his proboscis, which, fought with, which Joseph did, even though it doesn't work like that. So Jacob just died painfully with a bunch of perverts watching. When it was over, Joseph pressed a button on his staff, told the pharaoh, it's done, dude and then teleported back to continue on with pack and nines and stack and dimes that was all foretold in Joseph's prize-winning dreams. Thank you very much. I kept saying it in the chat and I'm just gonna start with it now. Wow, wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank oh you. my gosh. Dell, the poems of Annie Christine from the vanguards of holography, um, you know, laced with the laced with the images of popular culture figures and the wild mind of science. Oh my gosh, an, an, an incredible, incredible imagination. These, uh, I love how each of your poems to me was its own puzzle box, as you talked about um, in one of the poems, like, like just their, their own incredible puzzle boxes. And, um, and I might need a decoder ring, but that's right. okay. Like, right. like I want the decoder ring, right. you know, I, I want, the that with the book. <laughs> yeah, I want, right. you know, I want the serial prize decoder ring um for these like just 
uh, immaculate, wild poems. Oh, thank you so much you for so much. bringing them to us. And of course, thanks to Headmistress Press for also bringing them to us through uh, just, uh, just through your wonderful voice. I'm so, so glad to have had, to have heard these poems today. I'm so glad oh. to be here, thank you. Uh, well, I'll say one other thing about the first, I think it was the first poem. Um, and if I'm mistaken, and my tracking is off, I love the idea of having st um, stupidly, you know, like the tricks that nice. the tricks that we play on ourselves right. to amuse ourselves, like to write our poems. And I have a poem that I did the same thing with, like, oh, wow. and my word was the word phlebotomy. Like I was like, how, I, I love the word, how can I get it in? How many yeah. times can I get it in? Right. And it also kind of reminds me of the Villanelle, like different, yeah. like the, the way the structure works in the Villanelle, you know, could get, uh, or in the Sistina in particular, the Sistina can get that word that you want to use far too many times in, but um, but it works, it works. And, and that challenge of st stupidly. Oh my God, so great, so Thank great. You. Thanks again, uh, what a pleasure. And um, another book to add to my collection for sure. <laughs> <Yay>. I hope. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right, my friends, our final reader for today. Uh, uh, well, we're, there's so, so many things that I could say about Mary Miriam. Um, she has brought, she has, she has truly, truly acknowledged and kept the L in LGBTQ plus literature alive and well as the co-founder of Headmistress Press. And I am truly, truly grateful um, for that vision um, and that unparalleled commitment. Um, we have had the absolute pleasure on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry to have heard many headmistress press writers, poets. Um, and also we've been able to hear Mary's wonderful poetry um, during the tenure here. It's, it's, so it's one thing, you know, it's one thing to marvel at the editorship, but I also want to, uh, marvel at the poet that is that is Mary that can sometimes can sometimes get lost in the work of doing the work of an endeavor like Headmistress Press and her many 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 other endeavors and, and I'll mention those uh, in a moment. Well Mary Miriam co-founded Headmistress Press and edits the Lavender Review, uh, which I certainly encourage folks to check out. She edits the Lavender Review, Lesbian Poetry and Art. She's the author of My Girl's Green Jacket, 2018, and the Lillian Trilogy, 2015, both from Headmistress Press. Her poems appear recently, in Poetry, Post Road, Prelude, Subtropics, and the Poetry Review. Today, she will be reading from her new collection, Pools of June, which was published by Exot Books earlier this month. I dare anyone to have a better publication date than 2 2 20. Two. Oh, the numerology there. Um, a fun fact about Mary. 
Mary also has a children's book um, that I actually gave to my dad one Christmas. I love this book so much and look it up. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to put, I'm tempted to put it in the chat as well. Um, you know, again, I, there's, there's not enough I could say about Mary and frankly, Risa Denenberg, who's also here um, in the audience. And uh, we had a great run with a reading series that we did last year, The Collectibles. And I am just really grateful for uh, any time I get to interact uh, with Mary, but particularly when I get to hear her work. And so I'm very, very honored today to be able to um, celebrate and welcome the publication of Pools of June with all of you with Mary Miriam. Wow, Sandy, thank you so much. That was, I'm very honored by that introduction. Thank you. Um, one of the consequences of being a lesbian poet in the 70s and 80s when I was in college and graduate school was that I felt silenced. We barely even studied women poets. No one dared to utter the L word. And I kept any lesbian poems I wrote hidden, which I see now as damaging to the integrity of my poems. So these poems were fragmentary. And luckily I saved the fragments and decades later made them into two whole poems, which I'll be reading today from my new book, Pools of June. This is from published by Exot Books on 2222. And um, I'm just gonna dive right in here. Let's see, okay. Carol and I were lovers. Then Carol introduced me to Elizabeth Bishop, her handshake cool and tiny, not like Carol's. Unlike my lover's hot and eager hands, at least briefly, until Camille distracted me from Carol. A few years later, Carol met me at the Wise Ashbury reading. I was at Columbia. Carol had flown from San Francisco with her money. Oh, she was rich and free to visit NYC. She took me to her lavish suite. The doorman seemed upset by me. Perhaps he smelled my rented room. I can't recall the reading, lush and packed, no doubt. Carol and I on 92nd, her arm up. The taxi stops for us, but who jumps in but John? Stealing our taxi like he owns the street, not sorry. We're two invisibles as lesbians, young poets, excluded in 1980, ash in our eyes. Um, this is one of the poems that was like in fragments that I wrote during graduate school that I never felt I could show anybody. And um, here they are in the book now. Okay, as one whole poem, transplanted. You seem to know your way around the city, she says, turning from the piano and the tiny statuettes of geniuses. I send her a letter. Flight patterns branch out, forests of airports. The letter is distant as the diamond window on a ship to Venus. The day the idiots converge on the Hudson barges with flags, cheers, and souvenirs, I receive her reply, pleasure in other directions. At the entrance to the park, thick stench of dog shit, piles of cut gray branches, and a view of patches of dirt where games kill the grass. I sit on a bench reading in a haze of cherry petals. Why aren't we lovers, she says in your dream, the strange girl you tried to love who steals your sleep in a drug sprawl. She does that all the time, the drinkers at the Duchess say, blood in the bathroom sink from the girl who slits her wrists. Frantic, I race up and down the staircase. It's 1981, I think, the same damn lovesick song on the jukebox, the slower suicide dykes rooted to the bar, and my pale wild hunger as I carry rum and cokes to every dancer. The heart-shaped mole on your cheek says, love me, 
Your eyes embrace me, we strip. Your hands and your mouth travel my body as mine travel yours. No black night possible, just the color of rose dying on the air, four weak stars in the park, the dark-eyed fuchsia dying in the heavily gated window, rattled by trains. I want the roar and rustle of dark expanse, crazy leaves, solitude. I sit on the fire escape while day grows dusky, scanning the streets for the taxi she drives. Eclipse night, we circle Manhattan Island until she takes me over the bridge to her garden, just beginning to bear ripe red tomatoes. Catbirds sing and ruffle their feathers, attracted to pale trumpet vines in the suburb dawn. Surrounded by scents, I want to lie down and flower. Okay. I've got a, <laughs> I see you, Sandy. <laughs> I love when you do that. <laughs> um, hi, Yeva, how are you? <laughs> um, this is a villanelle, Susan, attention. I loved especially your last villanelle. It was fantastic, very moving. Uh, the last, I don't, uh, it was the last poem you read. I, I think it was a villanelle. Anyway, this is called One Time with Tam. In Soho, while the wealthy dined, we talked, we walked along the street to your stop, my stop. We don't mind that we don't stop nor go to find the dark below the empty seat. In Soho, while the wealthy dined, we spent a while and you were kind, your murmurs on the sidewalk sweet. Your stop, my stop, we don't mind. Go home, go home, the city whined. Go take your train. Still on our feet in Soho while the wealthy dined. You sensed, perhaps, that pit and rind were all I had at home to eat. Your stop, my stop. We don't mind so closely have our steps aligned. And you were all I had of heat in Soho while the wealthy dined. Your stop, my stop. We don't mind. Um, okay, I wrote this one after I had my one and only poem accepted at Poetry Magazine. So, um, I mean, you can decide for yourself how that, how that connects to this poem, <laughs> but I think emotionally I just felt like I've been trying for decades to get into Poetry Magazine. I was completely silenced in college and graduate school. And so it was just an emotional, you know, thing to have happen. She writes to her, Elaine once stood in music's breeze, conducting me in choirs and kisses, in box Chris Log and Todd and Todd's Bonden the alto mating the soprano in a duet that etched a lesbian nation in my chest. It was the 70s. I stood alone in death's dark closet, silence surrounding my secret glaring strangeness until the day I met Elaine, my only breeze and breath. For her, I sang in every language, standing in her stand of trees, suddenly in tune, open as heaven, released from underground and safe in her leaves. She taught with hands and scores the music I needed to start my pen in motion, a little binder of love lyrics I wrote to her. Elaine illuminated me. I stood alone in the dark auditorium, adoring her light, watching her play first cello in the symphony rehearsal. From the banks of a small stream in summer, she watched me naked in a waterfall, and we danced all night in disco sparkles. Then she left me, left me alone but she left me with a loving note. Sometimes the light of dusk or morning takes me to Sophie's healing, the pale or powerful colors where we loved, fields we walked in, hills we climbed, roads we traveled, <clears throat> plains we took to and from Tortola, the sea we swam, the beds we made lesbian. She drew me forth and took my picture. I tilled her garden and mixed her paint. We showed our poems to each other. 
Do you understand the wealth of color, my dear, of line, my owl? Each kiss between us, another treasure that fed the poems I wrote for college, skewing Sophie love to silence. How drifty it was to censor. How fully she filled my arms with gifts of body and water. How dearly she was into me, showing me art exhibited in fancy places and in her splattered studios, her true paintings blinded by dealers. So we held half in, half out, dangling and dancing and losing our minds. The bodies of fish in a clear creek surrounded by vivid mountains of fate that tore me in two and left me leaving. Emily wrote poems to Susie, wild nights. Three decades later, I learned what Lillian wrote in the seventies. By then I'd flooded and drowned three decades, saving the one marble left of myself. But then Lillian came billowing down my path, bearing her books, giving her flowers to me to keep. The whole world bloomed as I wandered in the land of Lillian, seeing her writing poems to her and she wrote poems to her and look at her words to her. And here are more poems of hers she wrote to her. All this had been hidden, mocked, erased, buried, burned in gardens that could never grow until unearthed and loved by Lillian. She gives sunlight and rain and seasons and makes the earth a welcoming place. She plucks and prunes, squeezes and clips with a touch as light as fairy dust until the mysterious scent of sadness becomes a field of waving daffodils. I write to her, she writes to me, I dedicate my books to Lillian and send them to her distant house with longing for my leafy trees and brightness from my flowing pen. <sighs> um, okay, this is the last one I'm gonna read and it's the last poem in the book actually. And it's the first poem that I was able to rescue um, from my early days in college. Actually, I think I wrote it after I finished college. So I wrote it about 1979, if you can believe it. Annie, you weren't even a thought in your parents' mind that in 1979. <laughs> your parents hadn't even met yet. <laughs> Anyhow, feeling kind of old right now. Um, by the way, your reading was fantastic as always. And I can't get over how every time I hear one of your poems, it's like, I've never heard this before. It's like, it's always new. So they're great. Um, oh, you were born in 1981. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I thought, yeah, they had a thought. They were, maybe they were on a date or something. Okay, okay, this is called Arrive. I move hoping you will arrive while the day and season are fresh and air gushes through the window. I long for your blondness and young sleek white silence. It is not enough my veins are stretching to their limits. Snow marks the upper mountains. Today, early summer, the honey locust, snow on the grass, and I think it is snow. I do not wish for any other season. Hot air stirs me. You say it is a beautiful night and ask me to go swimming while I begin the voice that transforms as it goes on. To be most concise is impossible. Like an Italian woman, I spread over the chair out of my clothes. Each day is a treasure. Day lilies sparkle on the dark roadside. An oak with large and fragrant leaves leans out of the forest. You are almost here, I imagine, and you are joyful and giving. Your pale body in the garden makes me weep, as does everything. Is it beauty, the pure water, my lips that finally fill out and sing? You bring water to me in every form. I cry for days, a horse you ride with broken reins. The skies are milky, the stars in your eyes obscure. Out of summer and what we have, a hoe, a hammock, mossy woods and marshes of lilies, what will we be able to save? Will memory be the green earth? And by the way, thank you, Riza Denenberg, for um, giving me 
the idea to put that poem last in this collection. Thank you. And thank you everyone for listening. <sighs> When's your next reading? <laughs> Everybody should get my book. Excellent so, books. When's your next reading? Oh my gosh. Oh, so, oh my gosh. Um, I I resonate deeply with the idea of fragments and 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 being being in writing from within the silence and not knowing if the if the poems could ever reach could ever could could ever reach beyond my closed journal even closed to my to myself and i what i think is so remarkable is that many would think well, that's an old story. That's 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 the past, and the thing is, it's not. Like it's it's um, writing from that place, resurrecting that resurrecting that work from a time when it didn't seem like it would have a space and time. Um, is is a is not only a tremendous gift to the self as a writer, but I think it's a tremendous gift to literature to that that we have the opportunities. And like you're providing the opportunities. Reese is providing the opportunities. So many people in this room and elsewhere providing these opportunities. You know, um, I remember not being able to use pronouns in my poems and being afraid to have the actual pronouns the her to her and um it wasn't that long it wasn't that long ago it wasn't that long ago and I'm so so grateful that you were able to take these fragments and make them whole not just for yourself but for the beauty for all of us to be able to um go on that journey that that sacred journey with you and to make sure that that we know that we that we know what um women's lives were like uh i would go back to lillian faderman you know the the word that dare you know that dare not speak its name and um so again thank you for Thank you for having the, the courage to go back to that work and make something wholly new, but honor, but honor what had been written. Um, there aren't a lot of folks that are gonna go back to their old journals like that and, and put the fragments together. And it's, it's a, I'll go back to Annie's, it's its own puzzle box. And so we were given the gift of your puzzle box. So thank you, Mary. Um, I cannot be articulate today after hearing that. I just, I can't, I, I can't even speak. So I know I've mumbled on about it, um, but I'm so grateful for those poems. Everybody, you have heard, um, the remarkable poetry across time and space and dimensions from our three poets today in our new book showcase, also known as our Lesbian Love Fest. You heard from Susan Abbott, Annie Christine, and Mary Miriam. And before I make a few final remarks, how about we unmute and thank these, these just uh, astounding poets for sharing their work with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, yeah, beautiful. Wow, that was rousing. That was rousing. That was rousing, as it should be. Well, since March of 2020, yeah. Cultivating Voices Live Poetry has been gathering poets from across the time zones to meet and share the love of poetry through our Facebook group and our weekly Sunday readings. In these two years, the world has certainly changed significantly, but we really have used this platform to make something of that change through our exchange of poetry. Muriel Rukeyser wrote uh, in 1947, in time of crisis, we summon all our strength in the introduction to the life of poetry. Well, our strength is our shared humanity articulated through the art of poetry. And what a display of that we had today. Thank you everyone for being here from your corner of the globe. And please join us next Sunday as we bring you more poetry and love live on our Sunday special, Love to the Second Power, a reading honoring Black History Month is a celebration of beloved poetry with featured poets, Yeva Johnson here in the room, Mark Gina McGowan here in the room with us today, and Gary Lilly, often here in the room with us, but I'm not sure he's here today, who will be sharing their work and the work of voices that have been profound and important to them. Well, Again, a reminder, I always close and, and share with you that our shared humanity depends on our deepest of listening. And again, today, uh, we were such beneficiaries of um, evocative, provocative poetry, and art for our love fest today. Our love fest is every day when we're here together. And I'm so grateful to have shared this very, very um, human space with you. I send you forth out into the world, encouraging you to Take very good care of yourself. Take very good care of your beloveds. And of course, do what each of these three, each of these three women have done and have shared today. You know, keep writing those stories, those poems that need to be heard even when we don't think they will ever see the light of day. Keep writing them, keep writing them. We will be here for those poems. Have a great week, everyone. And again, please join us next week and please pick up copies of the books from today's poets. Um, our support of them, is and the presses is so vital every day but certainly during um the pandemic it's been a great honor to share the reading today with everyone um very very moved by it and uh, i can't wait till next week all right we'll see you soon Peace, love, and poetry, as Kim Ports Parsons and I always say to each other. And thanks to Kim and to Don Krieger for your unswerving support of the program and to all of you for your unswerving support of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Peace out, my friends.